Please welcome Miss Senior America, Gail King. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you so much for your hospitality. It's true what they say about Tennessee. Thank you for that. You know, I do have some prepared notes, and I don't want to get too overcome, but I have to tell you that, yes, I am Miss Senior America. 35 years ago, I lay in the hospital, diagnosed with breast cancer. I was just 25 years old. I don't know that so many of you know that. And to be here today, to stand before you as Miss Senior America, is an incredible honor. And thank you for that. <laughs> Nobody would have thought that. I had less than a 30% chance of survival, got pregnant the next year, and now have two beautiful grandchildren. I would like to go back, though, and if you don't mind, to the year 1975. Jaws was the number one book, The Godfather was voted best picture, and Love Story was just about to be written. There were no computers, Blackberries, DVDs, or cell phones. In fact, we didn't even have cable TV. There were about 10 stations. In my third year as a high school English teacher, I wasn't <laughs> feeling well. I was losing weight. I uh, always had difficulty keeping the weight on anyhow. I'm about 105 pounds now. And I'd gone down to about 90 pounds, some hair loss, I was itching, rashes, and I knew that there was something wrong with me. I was flushing, hot and cold, and I didn't have that tremendous energy level that I've always been blessed with. I went to a doctor who sent me to an allergist, and there was something askew, and I had tremendous allergies. In fact, everything that I ate, I became allergic to. And I then was going to, I was teaching at the time, and I was doing my graduate work at Stony Brook University, a beautiful facility that today uh, has everything that you could want in the treatment. And I went in, and I was tired, and I remember going in and seeing Professor Sally, who was a bit of a character. It was a graduate course called Women and Literature. And Sally was telling us, that, uh, like Virginia Woolf, we need to be responsible for our own selves and our bodies. And then, much to my surprise, she drew this huge figure on the board. It was somewhat round, maybe a little more oblong, and she had a circle in the middle of it. And I heard giggles, and uh, people were still talking, and the copious student that I was, I copied the picture exactly as she drew it. And yeah, it was a giant breast on the board. And I looked and I thought, my gosh, how much did this graduate course pay me? What is she ever thinking? Well, Professor Sally, wherever you are today, you saved my life. I went home and I took a bath and I did as she suggested. I took soap and I did the procedure and I found the lump. But it doesn't stop there. When I went to another GP, we didn't have oncologists. There were no mammographies. We didn't have any of the MRIs. I went to a doctor, and he looked at me, and he said, well, you're kind of scrawny, but you're probably very busy. You're young. And he did some blood work, and nothing really came up, except that I was allergic to everything. Well, I insisted. I said, I feel something. I feel a lump. And he said, yes, you are correct, there is a lump there. But many women who are in their 20s are prone to cystitis. He said, and let's wait till your menstrual cycle. Let, let's see what happens. Meanwhile, I went to Stony Brook Library, I went to the university, in between my graduate course and my classes that I was teaching, and I did as much research as I possibly could. And I checked out all about lumps. And I called Dr. Bromberg again, and I said, I know I'm being annoying, but I know my body. This is not me. Something is askew, and I'm going to ask you again if I may come in, just to talk to you. Kind enough to let me come in. 
And he said, you're right, there is a lump there. You know what? You're not going to be happy till we do that biopsy. And I said, please, doctor, please remember, this is 35 years ago, unheard of. He said, is there a cancer in your family? There was not. He said, how old are you? I said, he's turned 25. He looked and, and he said, the chances are 10,000 to 1, it's benign. But you know what? Easter's coming up. He said, I'll book you two days before Easter. We'll go in, we'll do the biopsy, and we'll all have peace of mind. We can get on with it. And I know he was thinking I can stop calling and, and annoying him. <laughs> well, he did do the biopsy. And it turned out, of course, that that lump was benign. Underneath it was the, was the cancer. To this day, I'll never understand what happened. But it was cancerous. The doctor did listen to me, and I did mention to him I would very much like to have a one day in between, a reprieve, if you will, because I know me, and I know my strengths, and I wanted one day to, in my head to understand what was happening. I needed that 24 hours. And he said, well, at the time, he said, I went along with it because I truly thought it was benign, but why would I want to put you through that stress again of more anesthesia? But he respected my wishes. I learned very early on, you have to be your own advocate. Speak up. Do so, of course, in a polite way and respectful way. But people, this is your body. You're the ones that have to make the decisions. And I was so thrilled that he respected me enough to say, yes, we'll take the two days. I cried. I remember reading Betty Rowland's book later on, First You Cry, and I shed many a tear that particular day. I did not know what I was going to awaken to. Today, lumpectomies, if you will, and other treatment. At that time, I was told it would either be a Halstead or it would be a modified radical. And he explained to me that a Halstead is where they take your breast under your armpit and part of your chest muscle. And all I could think of is, when am I going to get back to school? My students need me. They're worrying. They're going to worry about me. I'm active. I need to do so much. But I went through the surgery, and I awakened, and I was fortunate in that it was just a modified radical. I lost the entire breast, a little bit under here, and my lymph nodes. And I remember him saying that you have to squeeze. You don't want to get edema, which, of course, I ended up getting anyhow. And I did the climb up the wall. I squeezed that tennis ball for hours upon hours. The tears can only come for so long. And then at the age of 25, you almost think you're invincible. So there's good and there's bad about being so young and being diagnosed. I remember that I insisted upon having my pen wads. Now, if you could imagine what I must have looked like in pen wads in this hospital. I also had to have, well, I was so thin that I had to have grafting. So I'd been hooked up to a machine, we had the grafting, but it didn't deter me. I put on the most gorgeous white pen wad that you ever saw. I was hot stuff. It was a little white ribbon. I was attached to machines. I got up, I did whatever I had to do, and within a week and a half, I was helping nurses deliver my beautiful flowers and visiting other children in the hospital as well. You want a wake-up call? Go do some volunteer work, help other people, and you will see what's important in life. And that truly did help me. The other aha moment that made it for me was watching my dad, whom I absolutely admired. He was a golden glover before he ended up in a different career, and a man who had tremendous, tremendous intrinsic values. And he said to me, you have to fight. This is going to be the fight of your life. And I thought, he's absolutely right. And that was the day that I decided to fight. And fight I did. I learned about having attitude. I wasn't going to be a victim and let cancer define me. I was not only going to be a survivor, because a survivor is a victim with attitude. And let me tell you, I've got plenty of that. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, I'm also a thriver because I'm here today to share with you. I'd like to take a couple of things, if I may, not take up too much of your time, but I do want to share a couple of things that definitely did help me. I was always given the students that other people didn't want. I, of course, I've taught my advanced placement. I taught so many different courses. But there was that recognition 
and the understanding that I was very good with the students that didn't always like school. I took a course which was called Alpha Mind Control. It wasn't hocus pocus, but please remember we're talking about the 70s, so we had all these fancy titles. And in this particular course, I was taught that whenever you heard anything that was negative, you were to say, cancel, cancel. Well, if you ever want to see 10th graders having fun, teach them the word cancel, cancel when you're speaking, and they have a chance to correct you. They loved it. So whenever a student would call another student something silly, stupid, you're never going to do it, you would hear, cancel, cancel. I took that philosophy and I applied it to myself. Whenever I'd have those negative thoughts, I'd think, cancel, cancel. And I started getting more and more positive. And I noticed that as I started to glow with this newfound understanding, other people picked up on it and treated me as such. They stopped giving me the look of pity, the look of, oh my gosh. And the other thing I did to stay positive is I surrounded myself with positive people. I did have to let some people go who were bringing me down. People who didn't understand that I wanted to desperately get well. And I didn't want to be labeled the woman with cancer at the age of 25. I wanted to be the woman who beat cancer and made something of herself. It was so important to me. I used visualization techniques where I actually saw this cancer that was in me being pushed out. And it was such a great feeling. And I also turned to humor. And let me tell you, when you're laughing, you don't have time to think about your aches and pains. And I could laugh at, the, at my wonderful people here, who are beautiful, beautiful people. I love to laugh, and it made me laugh so much in the last few days. And that's something that we have to remember to do. Because you see, life goes on. That sun comes up in that morning. And again, you, know, you don't always have to be number one to be a winner but you have to see things through. And that, I guess, is my biggest goal of all, seeing this through. So with that, I used those techniques. And then after that, I thought about how people could help me. You don't know how frustrating it is to go in to visit someone in a hospital and not know when you care for that person, what to do for that person. My husband had pancreatic cancer, and it was a very, very difficult time. But I'm going to tell you something. It was more difficult to be a caretaker for him than it was for me to have gone through my situation. I knew me. I knew what I needed. And many times, people close up when they're suffering with something. But you know what? I learned. Just go in, touch somebody, sit there, read the paper, smile. When he went in for his treatments, I would sometimes draw little happy faces. And those are the things that people remember most. And that's what I learned. I'm allowed to accept help from other people. I'm so darn independent. But it's OK. People love to help you. They want to do it. They feel better. And then finally, I learned to give back and to try to live in the moment, take one day at a time. And if I may close with the bard, William Shakespeare, and as you like it, he mentioned that there are so many uses in adversity. I think when I explained it to my students, it was something like, make lemonade out of lemons. And what do you learn from this? I learned how precious life is, how much compassion I have, how strong I am. I would never have entered a pageant like this years ago. And look at me now. Thank you.